everybody, we're here at the Ascent Amphitheater in Nashville, Tennessee with Widespread Panic, who are doing three nights here in this outdoor venue. It's a cool place, and even cooler than that is the fact that I get to talk to Jimmy Herring. Jimmy, how are you, man? It's I'm good great, to see you. I'm great, man. It's good to see you. <laughs> I'm Thank very happy you. to be here with you. Thank you so much. Man, you know the drill. You've seen some rig rundowns, so we're yeah. just going to jump in, man. Tell us about this beautiful PRS you have in your hands here. Well, thank you, man. This is a, this is a, a guitar that I've had probably, I'm, I'm guessing, around 20 years and mm -hmm. maybe longer. Um, Paul I, gave me this uh, 3P90. I, I guess it wasn't a standard 22. I can't remember what the model was called, but I loved it so much, and it had a neck on it. They called it a soap bar carve or soap bar it, it only came with that guitar with the p90s in it which is also known as a soap bar you know pickup yep anyway so i got him to make this guitar with that same neck shape and this was many years ago i mean it was 2000 when i was uh it was probably 18 or 20 years ago and um and i and the only other thing that's different about it other than uh you know uh the neck carve is i like to have a separate volume for each pickup uh -huh. and then a master tone, unless you're gonna have two tones, which is also great, very Gibson-like, you know. Yes. But this this one is just uh, volume for the neck, volume for the bridge, and then uh, tone control, master tone. And does it have stock pickups? Well, it, 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 it I've gone back and forth. Um, uh -huh. I'm tr I like the Lawler Imperials a lot. That's okay. what's in here right now. Okay. Yeah, they've been in there actually for, for a long time, but I played it for many years with the stock pickups and they sound great too. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, you need to change every now and then. Yep. You know? and, uh, and jumbo frets? Yeah. Um, yeah. These are these are I imagine six thousand wired. These 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 guitars are twenty five inch scale. I don't need them so much with these guitars as I do with a twenty five and a half inch guitar, yeah. uh, like a Stratocaster or a Telecaster. They have longer necks, and they're the big frets really help me a lot with them. And actually, they they help me with this one too, but. This being a half inch shorter, you can get away with smaller frets if you need to. For what I'm trying to do, what what I like to do is not have the action too low, uh -huh. and then um, the guitar speaks better, and the big frets help you to be able to raise the action up and still be able to play the guitar. Yeah, until you get more clarity and articulation. Yeah, yeah the notes jump out better, and you get better string to string definition, and it, it's easier to bend and things like that. Well, speaking of strings, what kind of strings do you use, and what gauge is on there now? Uh, they're just a, t a normal tin set from Daddario. Okay. Um, the nickel strings, we use the nickel ones. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else different about that? And you know, any Actually, any modifications in the capacitors or anything, or pretty well, much all? Well, Joel. Uh, Joel did do some stuff to the bridge. Where'd he go? I thought maybe he could tell you about it. It's uh, the bridge, you know, after you use the twang bar for a while and years, like I said, this guitar is close to 20 years old. Yeah. It started getting, you know, needing some uh, some love on the edges. Yep. And so he, he did that. He's great. He works great with metal. He works great with wood. So we could have gotten a new bridge from Paul, but Instead of bothering him, Joel just took it. He just fabricated. Yeah, he well, he just took the same bridge and he just smoothed out the edges oh, cool. around where they, you know, where the pivot is. Okay. And as a result, this guitar stays in tune fairly well. Excellent. You know, and there's nothing. Uh, oh yeah, what did you do to the bridge uh, when you when you smoothed out the edges of it somehow? Well, they're you know they're countersunk under these screws, mm -hmm. and I just basically made the made the knife edge more knife edgy. <laughs> okay, that way it, uh, so it's no, no less, friction. less binding and stuff, yeah. And this is your main guitar in general or on this tour? Typically with Panic, this is my main guitar. Okay. You know, okay. if I need a humbucker guitar, <clears throat> which is most of this gig, this is, this is the one I typically use. Okay. I've had it so long and it feels like home, you know. Well, let's take a look at what else you have in the rack if we can. Okay. Uh, I know you've got another another PRS in there, and you've got a Strat in there too. Yeah, yeah. There's this is a, a DGT that Paul was gracious enough to to build. <clears throat> this beautiful instrument. We use this mainly for the drop D songs. Okay. But sometimes if there's no drop D songs in the in the set list, we'll just set it up, you know, to play with yeah. standard tuning, and uh, it's a great instrument. And it's also got, what I like about the Grissoms is they have a separate volume for each pickup and uh, a master tone. And they all they also uh, have bigger fret wire than your standard issue uh, Paul Reed Smith 
these are stock, uh, but they're a little bit smaller than what I would typically use, but they still feel great. Cool. I mean, Grissom uses, he tunes down a half step and he likes the bigger wire because he uses bigger strings tuned down a half step. Yep. And so he likes that bigger wire too. Most people think you're nuts when you tell them, you know, you use 6,000 wire until they pick it up and feel it. And, and then it they're like, great. oh my God, this thing feels great. Well, you know. Yeah, the bending is yeah. especially cool. With yeah. That. Uh, mm -hmm. Lawler pickups in that one too. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Lawler, Imper Lawler, Lawler Imperials cool. in this in this guitar. Cool. Um, Joel keeps these things in tune pretty good. He knows how to set up the. I like to use four sp springs because uh, where I really did a number on myself trying to use three, and trying to learn about how to use a twang bar, and I didn't realize I, you know, bending the whole time just like I did before I used the twang bar, uh -huh. and it it did a number on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tendonitis. Yep. That good old tendonitis. And then we've got a cool strat. Yeah, this is a... <clears throat> Joel just put this one together for me. This is a great instrument, man. It's sort of like a 50s style. Four springs. I can't do what Jeff Beck does, so <laughs> I try to, you know, meet it in the middle instead of using three. How does he do that stuff? <laughs> I just saw him the other day, uh, like not maybe just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm absolutely floored. Yeah, we saw him two weeks ago in Nashville. Yeah, and he opened up and improvised for like a half hour straight. It yeah, was crazy. He it's is great. A, he is it's very special. You know, we all know this, yeah. but feel how light that is. Yeah, that is super light. It's super light. Yeah, it's and very comfortable. We've learned about the the. The light ash bodies tend to resonate better, and, and it, it took me forever to learn that. I found great, you know Greg Kalk? I do, yeah. You know Greg, yep. a great guitar player, does a lot of stuff for Wildwood guitars. Yeah. He, uh, he asked me one day, have you ever played an ash maple strat? And I was like, no. I mean, I've, all my strats were alder, you know, and had rosewood fingerboards on them. He's like, maybe you should try one. Because I was at Wildwood and I was going through a bunch of strats and I found this one and I don't have it with me, but it's a blonde <clears throat> ash maple strat. God. Now this is it one that blew my mind. This is one that Joel put together for you. Yeah. Do you know what essentially it's you know its DNA is all together? You know what the parts yeah, are? Yeah, it's an MJT body okay. with the nitrocellulose finish. It's a uh, uh, who makes the neck? Um, uh, oh 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 USA USA Custom Guitars makes, okay. makes the neck. Cool. And, um, you know. And do you have Lawlers in there too? Or? Uh, no, these are Don Mayer pickups. Okay. These are Don Mayer out of California. And the, the bridge is a Callaham that allows the string spacing to be more like a, a modern Strat, uh -huh. but it's on a six screw. You know, the it just makes the string spacing a little closer, which I find the vintage string spacing is difficult for me to pick, unless you only play that. And then when you switch right. to another guitar, you're like, ah, you know, because it's so different. <laughs> but uh, but this one, so this one feels like, uh, you know, the, the closer string spacing, but it's still a six screw. And uh, it's got the Callahan, you know, block in it, you know, so it's it's really good quality. You know? Cool. Anything I different like about the, the rest of it, about the switching configuration or anything? Or is it no. pretty much? Uh, uh, well, it's the got the, 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 the middle tone control is wired to the, normally that would just be, the neck. Mm -hmm. well, I've got it wired where it's both of these. Okay. And then this is only the bridge. Okay. Tone control. I mean, cool. I tried going with no tone control on the middle pickup, but it was too strident. Uh huh. You know, a little and, barky. Yeah. So I asked Joel if he could just put that jumper wire in that makes the middle tone control work for both of these, and uh, I like it a lot. Cool. It's really great. Cool. Well, shall we go take a look at your uh, at your rig over there? Okay. So here we are in your your part of the territory. You know, yeah. delineated here with the rug. This is your space. Yeah. And my then cave. let's. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Never leave this area. <laughs> so let's talk about what you have here. There's okay. a really interesting setup on the floor for controlling your monitors, but let's really focus on the amplifiers. Okay. And uh, let's talk about that homestead. Okay. How you got it? What you think about it? You know, where you like to have uh, uh, things set? The whole deal. Okay. Let's start there. Okay. Uh, Peter McMahon from Homestead Amps built this amplifier. This is a 100 watt version, but it's really probably more than 100 watts, right, Pete? Because it's got uh, six, uh, it's got four 6550s in it. Yeah, you know? Peter's right over here. He's by right the there. That's yeah. why we're talking to him. We're not just, yeah. we're not just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I never used 6550s in a guitar amp before Peter uh, showed me this amp. And I really didn't know what to expect. I thought, you know, you hear the, 
the, the general talk on it is is that they're they're stiff or they're 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 strident or mm -hmm. you know or hard sounding and I haven't found that to be the case with this amp I, it, it sounds really warm to me it sounds really good yeah you played it just a minute ago and it sounded yeah. super warm will you give us a taste of that thing yeah cool um, uh, this is dry you wanted to hear it dry right yeah let's hear it dry okay. and then let's well, it just... you gave a taste of us dry why don't you give us uh something with effects too all right well the only effect i use is reverb but reverb's nice the reverb it's a good comes one. through this <laughs> oh know, cool the idea is this line out box goes okay. between the amp and, and this dry cabinet here okay and so it basically you just take the speaker out and go into this and then it's got a speaker through that goes to this cabinet then this is actually a line out signal uh that goes into this volume pedal right here. Okay. That volume pedal goes to this Eventide space unit. And then that's a stereo unit that goes to uh, stereo into this power amp, which goes to this cabinet in stereo. Like these two speakers are one side. These two speakers are the other side. Cool. And it's purely wet coming through this side here. So, you know, the idea is, you know, it's really dry, you know. You know, and you can bring in wet through this side, you know. So if you want a lot, you know. See, the wet's coming from the other side. Cool. Uh, I manipulate it sometimes, you know, and have a little bit or a lot, or sometimes none, mm -hmm. depending on what you want. And that and you use the volume that. pedals to basically balance the two speaker cabinets and units. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then this volume pedal here is just straight from my guitar into the volume pedal. Okay. And then that volume pedal's so my guitar goes here, and then that goes to the Hughes and Kettner tube factor. And that's really the only pedal I use. Uh, other than the volume pedal, and this is just a remote switch for the Hughes and Kettner, you know, you can hear it yep. get hissy. And then uh, on this side, just just wetness, but I mean, you know, you can, you can hear... With this on, you know... The idea is to, you know, have more sustain and stuff with the overdrive box. Yeah, and it's an incredibly rich sound too. Thank you. Both of them are. Thank you. Very uh, much. Really amazing. Oh man, thanks. The speakers in this cabinet are uh, um, tone tubby um, ceramic speakers. Okay. Yeah, you know, 40 watt. 40, 40. They call them 40 for 40 or uh -huh. 40 40s or whatever. Okay. And I've had them for for decades. John Harrison was a good friend of mine, and I got. And this old Sound City cabinet, I just put them in there, you know, because I like these old cabinets. And that speak, that has EV forces in it. Okay. Yeah. And they're wired in stereo through the arm. Cool. We found some EV forces. I like the EVs a lot. And right behind you, you've got a bass mm -hmm. monitor, right? That's what yeah. the Ampeg is? Yeah, this is, I can just control how loud Dave is. Cool. From this, I mean, not not how loud he is. Some, some people <laughs> misunderstand. This only affects what I hear, yes. not what they hear. You can't turn Dave down from over here. No, no. <laughs> only only from from this position, what I hear. I, I've I've gotten kind of nasty messages from people about me controlling the other band members' mixes, uh, which of course only it's only from my ears. And yes, that's what that's all about. Yes. But, yeah, so I can turn Dave up or down. I can EQ it if I need to, but I never do. I just leave it like Joel sets it and just turn it up or down. Cool. Know. And while we're talking about that, obviously here, you, you here is where you do control all the other band members' mixes, at least just for yourself. You've right. got a, a pedal board down here with volume pedals, and basically you've got everybody's signal going in here. Yeah, what this was all about was um, is just being able, to, I'm not very good at trying to convey, you know, what I need to the, the monitor engineer. Mm -hmm when I'm trying to play. <laughs> and, 
and I'm not a singer, so it, you know, I think the I think the singer's need is undivided attention, you know. And even though he's like, man, we don't have to do this. I, you know, I'll do what you need, and and he would because he's one of the best in the business. Um, but this just makes my life simpler. Like, if I need drums, I step on this vine pedal a little bit more, a little bit less, whatever I need, percussion, keyboards, and the B3 has its own wedge because it's such a rich, you know, thing. It needs its own wedge, you know, so it, you know, yes. so it's clear, you know. Of course, yep. I am pretty close to him, but you are pretty if close. I need him, you know, I'll just do that, yep. you know. And then this is JB's voice, you know, <laughs> vocal. This is his guitar. So I can have more or less of his guitar or vocal. And the keyboards are the clavinet, the piano, and the Wurlitzer. And how long have you had this rig? Which is a great idea. Well, it started in uh, 2000 when I was playing with the Dead. And, you know, finding myself for the first time, sort of, on some of these big stages. Uh -huh. and, uh, and being completely out of my element and completely uncomfortable with how disconnected I felt on the giant stage from the rest of the group. And so I, I was talking to Dennis Leonard, the sound engineer, we call him Wiz, because he is, he's a wizard, you know. But uh, Wiz, I was talking to him, and I was like, man, you think you could rig up something where I could control my own mix from volume pedals? Because that way I wouldn't have to stop and turn a knob like you do in the studio where you have that thing sitting on a tripod. Yeah, the monitor, can, a control. You know, yeah. your headphone amp or whatever yeah. you call it. But, uh, you know, and he went, huh, well, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Never done that before. And I was like, well, I mean, it would just make my life easier because, uh, you know, I'd be able to uh, not have to, you know, get your attention to do whatever, I, you know, I need, which I'm no good at conveying that if I'm in the music. I, I'd yeah, have to stop playing to yeah. clearly say. Yeah, you want to keep your head in the right yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this keeps me from having to think about anything, you know? And, it, and I'm used to stepping on a volume pedal. I've been standing on one for most of my life, so, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, that's it. Well, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Hey, man. Yeah. Truly appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> my my pleasure. You. Great to meet you, too. <laughs> and here we are with JB on stage at the Ascend Amphitheater. And uh, JB is going to tell us about his guitars, his pedals, his amps, the whole deal. And this is your main guitar right now, right? That you've been playing on this tour? This is what I've been using on stage. Um, yeah, this one's probably Joel's five years old. I've had it, something like that. You've had it ever since I've been working for it, and that's been eight years. Okay, okay. then, <laughs> eight years. All right, and it's a Washburn <laughs> HP35. I can see a wooden block in there, so it's a, a semi hollow body. Uh, and uh, man, the uh, the uh, one of the important things is the color. Yeah, the color we were going is sweet. For, we were going for the color. <laughs> the color is sweet, and so is the binding. You know, uh, in the F holes and along the body. Is this a custom model, or is this? Uh, um, yeah, slightly. Basically, as far as the color went, it was okay. it was custom. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I've been playing this model since ninety since ninety. Okay. It, I know those hooked up with Washburn. Washburn humbuckers. And yep. Sure. Okay. Anything about the wiring we should know, or is it just pretty much traditional a wiring? Yep. Okay. Cool. And, it is a sweet uh, looking guitar. Use some little fatter strings. Uh, how are those kind of medium jumbo frets? These are too? 13. Uh, the most important thing for me is getting the, like the wound G. Okay. Because it stays in tune better and it kind of sounds a little better if you're playing slide or something. Cool. Like and that. did you say those are 13s? I believe. 13 on the high E? Uh, 12. 12s. 12 on the high E. All right, 12 sets. Cool. <laughs> cool. My lawyer's off stage. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have a lawyer off stage. <laughs> I think Hunter Thompson said that. Uh, <laughs> Cool. Well, let's take a look. Shall we take a look at the uh, at the other guitar? The uh, um, okay, the black yep. one. Any any major differences between the two other than red and black? Red and black's a pretty big difference. All right, well, you've got new pick. You've got different <laughs> pickups in there too. You've got Seymour Duncan's. Yep, and it's uh, and it's lighter. All right. Um, got the action a little bit higher because uh, um, with alternative tunings. Okay. I, uh, you know, it just benefits from the higher. Higher action on slide. Do you use that? Yeah, so you use that one for slide. Yep. And do you tend to play slide in open G? Um, a lot of it. Do okay. a little open D. Okay. Um, a lot of it's natural or drop D. Okay. You know, and that's uh, and what? and then we do some Vic Chestnut songs where he play um, the strings tuned down a whole step. Okay. So that uh, 
that gives a little extra flap to you know and get to wiggle and move around good. and those are also 12s yep. um, and uh, what kind of uh, Duncans do you have in there what kind of Duncans we got in here <laughs> So the red one has uh, pearly gates. This is gates. Joel, everybody. We're doing a, no legal consultation here. <laughs> uh, the red one has pearly gates, and I think this is an Alnico 2 Pro, and this is a custom. Very cool. That's Yeah, that was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you tend to be a neck pickup guy primarily? Are you regularly switching between combinations? I um, Usually, I'm right in the middle. I'm using them both. Okay. And then blending, depending on what I'm hearing in my ears. Okay. And what about your slide? You mentioned you use that guitar for slide. What kind of slide do you play? Um, brass slide on the pinky. Okay, cool. Yeah. Brass pinky slide. These All guys, right. I, the, and I like them. I like them weathered uh -huh. because they tend to grip the string a little bit more. And do you uh, do you pre-weather them uh, before you play? I know mean, a lot of people will leave them outside well, in the window and stuff. Yeah, we we do when we have to. Yeah. Um, because uh, I tend to like lose them. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. And, but if, <laughs> if they're too glossy, then they kind of sound a little little thin to me. Well, now, when you do play slide, do you, uh, do you, uh, is there a, a pedal or something that you use to kind of bring out the core tone you're going for? Or uh, I'm just going to chase this slide thing down for a minute. Okay. Um, my pedals are real minimum. Okay. Uh, I've, I keep a tube screamer on all the time okay. uh, just to fatten up the sound and give it a little interaction a little more feedback um, tamed feedback hopefully mm -hmm. um, if I'm just using it in a supportive role then I usually just stay there if uh, if inspiration hits and I'm and I'm gonna take it somewhere or let it take me somewhere um, then I've got another distortion pedal that I put on top of that you've got the full tone OCD over there right cool and I uh, yeah, I just got that because I like the name, but it sounds good too. <laughs> it does. Now you got a switcher over there that's marked Electric and Chet. Is one of these apps named Chet? No, it's <laughs> it's left over from uh, um, a solid body elect, you know, acoustic that uh, Chet yes. Atkins that I had. So that yeah. pedal's left over from days gone by. Okay, I wonder if you had a name for one of <laughs> your amplifiers. Uh, great, and you've got uh, obviously a tuner over there, and you've got the Wah, and the Wah does something special, doesn't it? Um, that's got a hip feature that we discovered because I do play to the Roland Jazz Chorus, and the wah and the chorus together is, you know, a little, a little wonky. Yeah. So, uh, so my attorney Joel here, he wired it up so when um, when I cut on the wah, it it turns off the uh, chorus. The chorus. Yeah. Cool. So there's a little little dual conversation going there. Well, and let's look at your amps. And do you run them both at the same time, or do you switch between? Or run them, both? At, the, run them at the same time. Cool. And okay. I'm getting, uh, I get mostly this in my headphones, but this is, uh, and I, I love the jazz chorus. I've had one, well, I had one when I first started out, and mm -hmm. then 25 years later, I came back to it. And, uh, but I keep the, um, you know, I like a fat tube sound to, come yeah. along with it and yeah. so you've it, got this it gives sort of, them something to work with you too. have this like really nice articulation coming out of the chorus and then you've got that fat nice big mid-range and stuff coming out of the fuchs through the mesa can yep cool and the fuchs is uh it's a really it's a really tight little unit yeah it's cool it's uh, uh that's a very compact 100 watt head and i know they make great heads and uh the voicing is super articulate in those amps too um what kind of speakers are in the mesa can um well, 412s. What kind of speakers we got in there, Joel? Stock, whatever stock. Stock. It's a, like a 90s basic cabinet. Is it closed okay. back? Let's see. Cool. Uh, it's probably closed, yeah, right? Yeah, closed back. Yep, yep. Cool. So, Well, great. Great, great. Uh, and on top, you've got a, a radio switcher up there, too, as well. Now, what is the radio if switcher? If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need an attorney again? Uh, <laughs> Just to talk about the radio for a minute, the tone bone. So this is this is from the pedal board. Here. Okay. And so it, it just splits the amps. So I'm just using it as a, a very basic but uh, it's nice splitter. Because it, it's got a ground lift and stuff on it, so you can if you have problems with hum and stuff, you can do stuff to it. So to cool. Make the ground the cool. hum go away. And then you know, let's just talk about the longevity of the band for a second too. You guys have been together. Is it 32 years now? Yep. Cool. I don't know. You just put out this uh, this uh, 
live recording for one of your shows, Knoxville 95, I think is the latest thing you guys put okay. out. Okay. Sounds like a great show. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been doing these archival releases, and to me, you guys have created such an amazing legacy. You know, you started as a band, friends in college, and you just kept playing and playing and playing, and people fell in love with what you do. You fell in love with your audiences, and here you are, 32 years later. That's amazing. It, one day at a time kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, congratulations. All right. It's tremendous. Appreciate it. All right, good yep. to meet you, man. All right, cheers. <laughs> Take care. All right, thanks. So here we are talking to Paul Augustino, and Paul is the man who makes sure the day from widespread panic is always ready to rock at any time. And Paul, man, let's let's walk through Dave's rig, if you don't mind. All righty. You know, his number one here is this uh, custom modulus. He calls it Merle. Merle. The, uh, yeah, I guess from the cut of wood. Uh-huh. And then his number two would be this Alembic, which is uh, mostly mahogany, but also custom built. I wish I could tell you more about it, but uh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yeah, it's a great looking. Uh, it's a yeah. great looking base. The shape is really interesting. Do these things have? Obviously, they've got active pickups. Mm -hmm. so you want to talk about the pickups and the electronics in these instruments? Uh, sure. These pickups are Bartolini's. Um, Olympic makes their own pickups. Um, that one has an active preamp. They both have active preamps in them. Um, the Olympic's a little bit hotter. Mm -hmm. They both have active EQ controls. Uh, one's a little, I think the modulus is a little more intuitive as far as uh, shelving, the highs and lows. But uh, they're both great sounding basses. He always has played six strings with this band. Cool. And there's a multi pin out on the uh, Olympic as well? Yes, there is. Cool. And does yep. Dave use that for anything? Or? Uh, I mean, it powers the bass. It does have multi channel outs, but we don't use it. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. Both great instruments. Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about his power amp first. Should we do okay. that? Sure. Um, it's a D and B rig, and it's okay. basically a mirror of what we use as a PA. Okay. So uh, he was inspired to put this rig together by uh, Phil Lesh's rig. He's got a little Meyer PA he uses on stage, and so I mean he used Ampeg eight by tens and SVT heads for decades, mm -hmm. and we may be going back to that. Who knows? He he you know. Well, what's, changes his mind. What's the output on that? Oh boy, how many watts? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Um, I can tell you I'm bi-amping it. Okay. So um, I'm running all the highs through these uh, Y10s, okay. also made by D&B. And these are 215s for the low end. And then I got 218s that are actually controlled by my monitor engineer. Oh, so nice. there's some kick drum down in here. But uh, so it's both a monitor and a bass rig. But yeah, the idea was to match the, um, you know, all the drivers <laughs> and the power amp are the same we're using for our PA boxes. So the idea was any tone shaping he does on this Avalon Pre mm -hmm. or he does on his guitar, he's going to hear how it translates through the PA. So he, people call it a bass rig. It's kind of a glorified DI. Well, cool. <laughs> you know, a lot of people use the Avalon because, well, it's got a great voice. Yeah. You yeah. know, what what, uh, what does Dave really uh, dig about it? Or what do you like about it? You know, why don't you talk about the use of the Avalon? Oh, uh, you know, we just use a slight compression and the EQ is, is pretty minimal on it too. So really barely using it as an effect. Um, there's some tube warrant from the preamp. But uh, yeah, I love it. We've used Dimiter stuff in the past for tube pre's and compressors. I was real happy with that too. Um, Avalon's just super clean. Cool. And why don't we talk about, uh, well, let's work our way back through the rig. If okay. We can. All right, so um, basically I'm running through this octa switch to switch all the effects up here. Mm -hmm. And he likes them up uh, under his fingertips so he can uh, play with them during the show. And this is just switching the effects loops so that uh, signal's not running through them all the time. Uh, and downstage he uses his delay and uh, the octave switch quite quite a lot. Cool, and I noticed it's one of the new Wazacraft uh, Boss Delays. Yeah, and uh, boy, he's a pedal fanatic. We switch pedals all the time. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'm surprised there's not an envelope filter in this current setup, but he's definitely relied on that a lot in the past, a lot of different delays. Well, let's talk about what is in the, uh, in the current setup up here, too. Okay, uh, two different types of delays. <laughs> Uh, flanger. Mm -hmm. This thing is an octave generator. I've been really happy with this. The Walrus Audio Luminary. Luminary. Yeah. Okay. Does two octaves up and down and an octave up and down. And this is uh, an SVT. Kind of mimics the tube distortion of what his rig used to be before we switched to the DMB rig. Cool. That's a Catlin bred SFT. Yep. And there's another Catlin bred over too. That's the Echo Rec, which yep. is kind of one of their classic pedals. Yep. We've got the the kilobyte, the low fly delay over on the right. Mm -hmm. And we've got the depths in here My for some cool, yeah, very nice. And again, I have got 
drawers full of effects pedals and he's always changing out toys. Is he literally doing it like from show to show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Sometimes he'll he'll get bored and he'll say, you know, surprise me. Put out a new effect <laughs> for me to play with, you know? I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Well, cool. It's a very, uh, very two beautiful bases, very mm -hmm. lovely crafted, running into a, essentially a very simple rig. Right. With some nice tone colors on top. And the tone coloring is pretty minimal. It's very, it sounds a lot like a DI. Yep. Very high fidelity in your face. Cool, and I see you've got a pedal power down there, a Google yep. Labs pedal power too. Yep. And that's what's running the uh, pedals up top running side. these guys. Great. Yep. Cool, and, and that's we have much a it. volume pedal yep, here. Yep, the volume pedal. Uh, really, he just uses that to tune. You okay. Know? He kind of uses it as a mute switch. He got used to that, I think, in the 80s, and we've always just kind of kept it there. And what kind of tuner is he using? Uh, this oh, right. Oh, it's right there, yeah. right? Right here, yeah. The GTR2? Yep. Cool. Very good. That's it. Let's see. He was wireless for years, so I mm -hmm. still have some remnants of the wireless rig in the rack. Uh, but now he's been wearing a wire, and again, the fidelity difference is so so much better. And when you have a rig like this, you can really hear these the nuance, high end, and what have you. Well, I'm curious. You know, for our readers who don't play venues of quite this size, who mm -hmm. use wirelesses, there's a lot of metal around here and a lot of cement. How does that impact controlling a wireless? Uh, you know, it's really good if he stays put, uh -huh. you know, he's, uh, when he's only 10 feet from the receiver, yeah, we had but if you start minimal moving problems, out, yeah. yeah, but definitely when he would walk around, uh, even just over to the monitor desk, you would start getting weird things happen, so, but uh, pretty minimal, you know, it, it wasn't interference was the issue as much as just the loss of fidelity, you uh -huh. know, it goes into that little digital converter and then the wireless frequencies, and when it spits out the other end, you... You never know what you're going to get. Well, cool, man. Thanks for filling us in today's yeah. rig. We really appreciate it. No problem, it. man. Thanks Great for your time. Great to meet you. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the latest rig rundown. Guess what? Every week, we upload a brand new rig rundown to PremierGuitar.com a full week before it's available here on YouTube. So to get your gear fix as soon as humanly possible, go to PremierGuitar.com forward slash rig rundown. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get an email notification so you're the first to know as soon as each week's new rig rundown is available. Cheers. See you soon.